Well, hello there. For those of you I have not met yet, my name is Harry Bates. I've been a pastor at New Life Church now for 15 years. My wife, Cheryl and I, we've been part of New Life Church now for almost 21 years. And I'm currently, I'm at our West Little Rock campus, love what God's doing there. And I'm so glad that you are still with us. You've been with us for several weeks now of Foundations. If you're still here and you're hanging in there like a hair in a biscuit, so you might as well just stay with us to the end. Well, this week, we're going to cover the topic of my friend, the Holy Spirit. Now, if you've read the New Testament, you see that it starts with four books dedicated to the life of Christ, told by four different authors. They are called the Gospels. And immediately after the Gospels, we have a fifth book. That's called the Book of Acts. It's all about the early church. The book starts off with the promise Holy Spirit being poured out on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, just like Jesus prophesied it would be done. Then the early church begins to grow at a rapid pace over the next two decades. And today I want to pick up and I want to look in chapter 19 of the book of Acts. So in Acts chapter 19, verse 1 and 2, it says this, while Apollos was at Corinth, it says that Paul took the road through the interior and he arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, no, we've not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. You know, what's interesting is many of you, you're just like them. You've never heard much on the Holy Spirit. When we mention the Holy Spirit, we are aware this may evoke various emotions based on the church you were raised in or a church you attended before New Life Church or maybe even Christian TV that you have watched. You know, I've noticed that many churches, they spend a great deal of time talking about God the Father and may spend a great amount of time speaking about God the Son, Jesus, but they make absolutely no mention of the Holy Spirit because they don't understand it for many of them. Or... If they speak about the Holy Spirit, they say, well, that's the Holy Spirit. That's for the spooky and weird church down the street. Or those weird people on Christian TV with the purple hair. You know what I'm talking about? But either way, either one of those camps, you've got to either wear way too much makeup or wear no makeup at all to know about the Holy Spirit. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Listen, if, if you've heard it called the Holy Ghost and you're like, man, I'm scared of ghosts. I couldn't even watch Casper the Friendly Ghost when I was growing up. That, that may be where you land too, but here's what I know. Others, you may have been a part of a denomination that potentially abused the Holy Spirit. Basically, here's what I'm saying. The Holy Spirit has gotten a bad rap by the 20th and 21st century church. I'm thankful we're all part of a healthy church that believes in bringing honor to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, being honest, He's my best friend. Not Sherilyn. Not my wife, but the Holy Spirit. But I promise, Sherilyn, you're the number one human person in the flesh for me. But listen to this. If you really know Pastor Rick, you know your campus pastor or me, we're not spooky and weird at all. There's 0% chance we would have a spooky or weird best friend, except for maybe Rick's friends Boudreaux and Thibodeau. But that's a completely different discussion. But we would only have a best friend that is great, is a great counselor. He gives us wisdom. He loves us. He cares for us. He's real. He's transparent. He sees our blind spots. I mean, he honestly looks out for our best interests. He encourages us to fulfill the calling that God has placed on us. That's the kind of best friend that we must have. Now, not only do we talk about God the Father, the Son, but we talk about our best friend, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God has always been in existence. Let's look in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. It says this in the beginning here is where it's talking about. It says, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God, right there, there it is, and the Spirit of God, was hovering over the waters. I, I, I want to give you three reasons that people have difficulty in understanding the Holy Spirit outside of some of the reasons I've already mentioned to you. Here, here's the first reason. The Holy Spirit, it's unseen. In John chapter 14, verse 16 and 17, listen what it says. 
It says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world, though, cannot accept him because, here it is, it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and he will be in you. The advocate, the comforter, our counselor, our helper. People can't handle an unseen part of God. It's just only, only something they feel. You know, we, we've heard this saying, seeing is believing. Well, we struggle with not being able to see things. But I would think you all have to agree that the reason you keep coming is because you feel something different here. I remember here not too long ago, Pastor Rick, he had a man mentioned to him recently. He, he told him, he said, Be that. He said, I can't come to church here that often. He said, I feel something different when I'm there and it, it makes me all emotional. It makes me cry. It makes me want to give you all my money. <laughs> Well, Pastor Rick says, that's okay. But not only is the Holy Spirit unseen, secondly, I want to tell you this, the Holy Spirit is unpredictable. And in John chapter 3, verse 8, you can see this. It says that Jesus answered, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going, so it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Listen, some of us, we like a real orderly God. But here's the deal. He doesn't do it the same way every time. It's because He doesn't want you to worship a system or become too ritualistic. He wants you to desire more of Him and trust that, that He'll show up even if it's not in a way you're expecting. You know, he even spoke out of a burning bush. But one time, only once. You know, one time, a guy asked Jesus to put his hands on his blind friend to heal him, like he had seen him do before. He had seen him lay his hands on somebody and, and heal him. But, but guess what God did? He did it differently. He healed him. But this time, he did it by, Puh! he spit in some dirt, he slapped some mud in the guy's eyes. Can you imagine what his friend was thinking? Like, you're really going to put mud pies in my friend's eyes made by your own spit? But he was healed. And then the third one is this. The Holy Spirit is powerful. That's a struggle for some people. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. How many times have you heard people come to church for the first time and say, man, I felt something different in there today, right? I mean, I can't even tell you how many times I've heard people say it. Guess what it was? It was the power of God. It was the presence of the Holy Spirit. Listen, when people are genuinely pursuing more of God, worshiping Jesus with all their heart, the power and the presence of God, it will be so tangible. His presence is so powerful at times, it moves even the strongest and roughest of people. I've seen the biggest, the baddest, the toughest men. I've watched and seen them just break under the power of the Holy Spirit. The real truth, you need the power of the Holy Spirit. Because in your own power, you'll fail. In my own power, I have failed a countless number of times. I need somebody to help me. You need somebody to help you. The Holy Spirit, He wants to be your helper. I, I just want to really quick give you this too. I want to give you three quick reasons on why you must have the Holy Spirit. The first reason is, I just want to tell you, you need an advocate. Look at this. I read this earlier. I'm going to read it again. You need an advocate. In John 14, verse 16 and 17, it says this. It says, And I will ask the Father... And he will give you another advocate to help you to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you will know him for he lives with you and he will be with you. We need somebody who is fighting on our behalf, talking to the father and advocate. The second thing you really need is you need somebody that will always remind you of Jesus. It's one of the chief jobs of the advocate, the Holy Spirit. Look down in verse 26. It says, But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, 
whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. One of the chief jobs of the Holy Spirit is to remind us what Jesus did and what he said. And the last thing I, I will have to tell you is the spirit of truth will bring us to the truth. And I'm going to tell you what, in this day and age, we must know the truth. Listen to what John 16, 13, it says here. It says, but when he, the spirit of truth, when he comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and will tell you what is yet to come. So now, let's really quickly, let's, let's bring this to a close and talk about how is it that you allow the Holy Spirit to take control? How do we allow the Holy Spirit to take control? Well, I want to really quickly give you three reasons on how you do this. Number one is you got to let go of your fears and misperceptions. We talked about some of these fears and misperceptions, but you got to let go of them. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure everything out on your own. Listen to me. God will never ask you to do anything weird. I've known the Holy Spirit for a long time. He's never asked me to do anything crazy. He's never done anything to embarrass me or anyone else. I've seen people be embarrassed, but it wasn't because they were following the leading of the Holy Spirit. But I've got to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit and not the voice of Harry. There are times I have listened to the voice of Harry instead of the voice of the Holy Spirit, and it's cost me. I'll never forget one time. I, I wanted to show out. I was with my friends and with my kids. We were at the lake one time, and I was about to jump off a cliff, and, and all the kids had jumped off, and they jumped off like you supposed to, feet first. And I was going to jump off and make a big splash because I'm a cool dad, right? And I went to jump off to make this big splash. I was going to do what they call a preacher seat, you know, because I'm a pastor, right? And I went to lay back, to land on on my bottom and make a big splash. And there was something in me. It was the Holy Spirit saying, I wouldn't do it. But guess what? I listened to the voice of Harry. I did the preacher seat. And when I hit that water, let me tell you what, it felt like my rear end was on fire and it never stopped. You know why? I broke my tailbone. I broke my tailbone because I wasn't listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. He was trying to help me out if I would have only listened. L let me tell you a secret. The Holy Spirit, my best friend, he's a gentleman. He's not going to knock down the door. No, he's going to knock. He wants us to listen. And, uh, but we've got to do it. We've got to listen. The second thing is this. We've got to go all in. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13, it says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Listen, God wants to bless you so bad. But more than that, He wants you to trust Him with everything. Like, listen, here's what I want you to, I want you to get this. Please listen. You must learn to pray. Lord, if you have it, I want it. Whatever you have, Lord, if you have it, I, I want it. And the third and final thing, we'll close with this, is develop an intimate friendship with the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, it says this in the message translation. It says, The amazing grace of the Master, Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God, and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Here's what you got to know. God the Father loves me, but Satan's going to try to sabotage this with father wounds. God the Son he saved me. He poured out His grace on me. He paid the price for me. But too many stop right there. Lastly, we got to remember that God, the Holy Spirit, He is with me. Jesus said, it's better that I go away. Listen, you need the Spirit of God to keep you out of trouble, to protect you, to lead you, to encourage you, and to strengthen you. I hope this has helped you. Please know we got more to come. I pray you're going to stay with us. Why don't I do this before we go? I want to go ahead and just pray with you. Lord, I just thank you, Father God, for how much you love me. Jesus, thank you for your grace 
and your mercy and that you came from heaven to earth to die on a cross for me. You shed your blood for me. And then lastly, I thank you for the Holy Spirit. Jesus, I thank you that you said it was better for you to go away so the Holy Spirit could be with me. And he could bring me into all truth, the advocate, my helper, my counselor, ultimately my best friend. I just thank you for how you have been with me every step of the way. You give me the advice I need, the protection uh, that I need. And I just pray that all those listening would desire to hear your voice, to know your voice more than they know anybody else's voice on this planet. We love you and we thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for joining us today. We'll see you next week.